here at the Kerr Center in Poto, Oklahoma. And joining us is David Redditch, and he is the president and CEO of the Kerr Center for S Sustainability. And can you kind of tell us about the Kerr Center and what their mission is? Well, the Kerr Center for Sustainable Agriculture was set up in the mid-60s. And in 1985, it went to a sustainable agriculture organization. And our mission is to educate people on sustainable agriculture in Oklahoma and other areas of the United States outside. So that is what we do here. And you have a, an amazing laboratory here, basically, and you're doing all forms of agriculture. But what brought us was your new pollinator gardener that you've installed here. Can you kind of tell us about some of the plants? You've got a great one here. Yes. This is the this, rattlesnake plant. Yes, this is called Rattlesnake Master. It's kind of a unique plant from the look of it. It works structurally in the landscape because of the leaves and the flower heads on it, which believe it or not, these are the flowers. Yeah. And they don't look like flowers. So, um, but the amount of pollinators that use this one is in blossom, it's incredible. We see bees, beetles, wasps all over this plant when it's in flower. So, and it's very drought tolerant, it's native. Um, it just handles Oklahoma's conditions. Right. And I, I grew these from seeds collected on the ranch. Okay. So uh, this is regionally propagated from seed. And as you can see, it's taken several years to establish. And that's, I think, a key thing with native plants is they take longer to establish than a lot of the flowers we may buy at um, the nurseries and that. These, you let them sit in the ground for several years. Once they get settled into the location, then they take off. And a lot of times you might not see foliage growing, but what they're doing is they're establishing those roots. Yes, and anybody who knows Oklahoma's drought conditions, um, these plants tend to have very deep root systems. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's why you've actually propagated a lot of them by seed or by cuttings because you can't go dig these up. There's no mm. getting that tap root out of the no, ground. No, digging, digging up a plant and transplant it doesn't work for a lot of these native plants. They really need to either become from a pot grown plant or you collect the seeds and propagate them yourselves. And one you have that's growing pretty well here is a nice little ground cover. Yes, this has kind of been recommended as a trial for a ground cover this is called yellow puff uh -huh. and it's related to cat's claw sensitive briar if you touch the leaves they actually close up like a sensitive plant would and it is native to prairies in oklahoma and as you can tell by the structure it's a legume a uh, very uh, feathery looking puffy by the name flowers on it yeah but they're attractive to small pollinators i've even seen honeybees on it now so, it doesn't have the thorns on it like No, and that's claw. the thing. Cat's Claw Sensor Bar, by its name, has thorns. This has no thorns on it. Okay, great. <laughs> we, we don't like thorns all the time. <laughs> Another great yellow puff flower is your Hypericum here. And this yes. is a native again. Yes, shrubby St. John's wort. Uh, and you need to be careful when buying them because there's some introduced species that can be invasive. But Oklahoma has several native uh, Hypericums, and mm -hmm. they work great in the landscape. They're very tidy, they're very tight structured, and they have that yellow globular flower on there that's attractive to pollinators. And a lot of times you'll hear some of these plants and they might sound familiar names when you've gone to your drugstore. So. Yeah, from the herbal perspective, a lot of them have some herbal uses to them. And so that's what's kind of neat, the history of these plants when you read about them, what they were used for. So we're adding a little of Oklahoma to the landscape. Right, right. Well, I see another one that's one of my favorites. So this one is past blooming right now. Um, but we've got this amorpha here, and can you tell us about it? Well, this is a shrubby, it's related to the lead plant, which I love the land plant in the mm -hmm. landscape. But this one gets taller, it has more like a shrubby tree-like structure to it. It likes wet areas, mm -hmm. it is a legume, blooms early in the spring, and again, the flowers are very, uh, um, kind of a pale color, but they're striking on the plant. And this one, I collected the seed on the ranch again, um, I propagated this from seed, and it's turned out to uh, work very well. <clears throat> it kind of gives that woody aspect to landscape. One thing about establishing this native plant landscape <clears throat> was to give people a place to go to see what native plants look like in the landscape, but also to promote the idea of including them in wildscapes for pollinators. And some of the struggles I've had with establishing native plants, dealing with Bermuda, Johnson grass, crabgrass, native native plants, uh, established, so I started looking at shrubs and trees that are native. This is one of the shrubs that seems to be doing very well, and I would recommend it to someone who has had a wet spot or an area low lying that they had that if they're going to deal with Bermuda grass or something in the area, this could out compete 
and uh, provide pollinator habitat. That's great, and it also adds a little bit of height to your landscape. Another plant we have adding some height here is the uh, the giant coneflower. Yeah, Rebecca maxima. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a very has that almost the, the when it's growing in the spring, it has the look of a hostel mm -hmm. on the bottom. But then it shoots this big long stalk up, and then it has the yellow rays on the bottom, and it has the seed head above it. And it's a dramatic plant landscape. I'd be careful not to overdo, put too much in, right. but it's like a specimen plant. Yes. And it works really well in that role. Yeah, and it's one of those that will surprise you once it starts shooting up. Yes. But, but uh, birds actually like to sit on these also. So yes. if you're a bird watcher, it gives you that opportunity to see them. Um, we've got another ground cover here that's just taking off. And I, <laughs> I love the name of it, frog fruit. Yes. Um, but it has a little bit of a, like a verbena almost like flower to it. Yes. This one is what I call bulletproof tough as nails. <laughs> this thing will take downpours, torrential downpours. It'll take hot searing heat. It blooms constantly all summer long. <clears throat> and most people are looking at pollinator plants that um, attract the big pollinators like honeybees. But this one attracts those, but it also attracts a lot of little pollinators. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of stand here and look at it, and we can see all these little pollinators just flying around all these flowers. Mm -hmm. But it provides a continuous food source all summer long for those pollinators. It is, seems to be a little aggressive in a landscape, so that's something to be aware of if you're going to plant it. And one thing you mentioned about when you're designing for a pollinator garden, kind of your rule is to have three blooming plants each season. Yes. And that's because in the spring, you've got the bumblebees coming out of hibernation, the honeybees are taking off. You need that initial food source during the summer, of course you need it. And then when you move into the falls, uh, pollinators like bumblebees require the, the queens have to build fat reserves. Mm -hmm. What they need is plants that are blooming in the fall, such as asters and goldenrods, to give them that food source so they can survive through the winter. So what I like about this garden, too, is that you've kind of you've incorporated some of your ornamental grasses as well, which are important to keep that balance for those pollinators. Yes. So let's talk about some of the grasses here. You have little blue stem and you have a really great switchgrass over yes. here. Let's take a look at the switchgrass here. It's called Dust Devil. Yes. Is the cultivar. Can you tell me about it? Uh, Dust Devil is, uh, it, it was selected more, it looks like for more of the leaf color on it and the clumping aspect of it. And every spring I cut this back I don't know why we use a lot of pompous grasses in that in landscapes, but to me, our native grasses have a tremendous potential mm -hmm. that's overlooked in Oklahoma landscapes and elsewhere in the United States. I don't understand why we don't use more native grasses, but the key is selecting for plants that maintain an upright habitat and stay in that clumping effect. And it also is beneficial to, in Oklahoma, we have a, a whole series of butterflies called grass skippers. And the larvae require grasses and switchgrass, Indian grass, little blue stem, big blue stem are the food sources for the larvae. So it benefits pollinators in the sense that it's a food source. So David, the Kerr Center has done a lot of research and you have some information. Where can our viewers find that information? Well, they can go to the Kerr Center's website. We have the publication that dealt with uh, all these landscape plants here on the property and some other publication about bloom times and also resource lists for people if they're interested in doing their own research, different publications, websites, and what can work for them in their area of Oklahoma. Excellent. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.